Thanks for joining me for this uh, digital virtual presentation. Uh, my name is Matt Panfill and I am the Healer Art Director and Co-Founder uh, since 2017. And I'm going to talk about uh, Healer and the Rise of Immersive Art. So, uh, first, if you're not familiar with us, here's a quick little promo video. Looks like another world. Um, you know, thankfully, so we've been closed indoors uh, since last March because of the pandemic. Um, but uh, we have an, a whole outdoor area. Um, I don't have images of that in this presentation. Um, but we've been open for outdoor shows and hopefully going to reopen indoors um, in August. So some healer origin, some questions you might have. Why, when, for what purpose? Um, so my approach to healer stems from, you know, kind of an understanding of the origin of, of um, how we experience art. So in 1863, a private collection of natural history curiosities was donated to the University of Oxford. The collection was later opened to the public and the Ashmolean Museum became the first permanent public exhibition housed by a corporation, the first art museum. The act of opening art to the public simultaneously closes its definition to the commons, explicitly defining both space and art as exclusive and invulnerable. As with any establishment, be they media, church, or government, the richest of galleries are canonized to the point where the public's role and contribution is reduced to that of passive observer until now. This comes from Momar and AR Art Collective. Um, they're like a cool guerrilla group, um, and they basically uh, take uh, use digital technology like augmented reality to um, subvert and comment upon traditional art um, galleries. Um, and I love this quote because it speaks to how we can transform the traditional um, white cube uh, gallery experience. The white cube is conceived as a place free of context where time and social space are thought to be excluded from the experience of artworks. Uh, if you think of any kind of traditional art gallery where the art is confined to its spaces and you view it and you look at it in the space and there's separation between the viewer and the art itself. Uh, some implicit rules are do not touch the art, do not cross the velvet rope, the alarm will go off, do not look at the art too closely. Um, everything is framed, there's a cost of entry, borders of all kinds. Think about what's been happening with, uh, with Newfields or the IMA recently. Um, there's a stuffy uh, sort of distance um, between the holder of the art and the, uh, or the, the person who's exhibiting the art and the art itself. The birth of experiential art uh, throws a wrench in this old hierarchy, uh, such as cursed Kurt Schwitter's Mersbau in 1933, which is thought of as one of the first contemporary examples of an immersive art installation on a large scale. Um, 
Krapow, this Polish artist um, who came up with the unart movement in the 50s. Art is an experience. So he'd fill art spaces with objects um, for people to play with, uh, to change the setting. There is no barrier anymore between the artist as the visitor and the art they were experiencing and even in fact manipulating. Um, Kus uh, Kasuma, um, uh, who's just a legendary Japanese artist toying with the space, with the idea of making small spaces infinite. Um, transforming uh, the, the art space entirely. Um, Burning Man and radically inclusive art, uh, which have these main tenets about having art uh, be available to everyone, able to be created to everyone, an idea of recycling and upcycling uh, material, which is then destroyed and then recreated each year. Uh, the City Museum in St. Louis is an awesome um, experiential art you know, palace um, meant for people to explore um, and, and engage with the environment of the art. Uh, Meow Wolf in Santa Fe. Um, I actually have ties to Meow Wolf because I went to school in Santa Fe during their inception when they put on these very low budget DIY, you know, even more, um, uh, even, even more basic uh, and, and low budget than Healer, um, where they'd have, you know, um, just reusing TVs and plastic bags, whatever they could find and to transform. And now uh, they're one of the most, you know, largest well-known um, kind of viral art sensation companies out there. Um, Healer Origins. So in grad school, uh, I started making temporary art installations. Um, and I've always been a multimedia artist and I love to, um, you know, infuse different elements into my installation works. So if I can take, you know, elements of sculptural work um, and woodworking and uh, projection video art and combine something to make a novel experience, that's really what draws me to installation work. So I was making these temporary projects and then um, some friends of mine, a friend I used to be in a band with, he reached out and he said, hey, my friend, um, has we use this this uh, abandoned office space um, as a practice uh, location for our band um, and the owner was my friend's dad and he said basically we're thinking of turning it into a music venue uh, it's just an abandoned office building with cubicles uh, would you be interested in making some of the art and i immediately thought yes because i was making these temporary art installations anyway um, so these are uh, my wife, who was one, who was our manager before she went off to be a doctor, um, Ben and Colin, who are my business partners, um, who are still involved, uh, who manage the music side while I focus on the art side, and my friend Liz, who was my first, you know, um, installation uh, co-collaborator, who also helped create um, these initial installations with me. Um, so here's our mission statement. Healer DIY is an all ages, collaborative, interactive, immersive art and live music venue dedicated to freedom of expression and creative exploration. Though donations are encouraged at the door, no one will be turned away for the in inability to pay. Healer exists as an enjoyable, good vibes environs for people of all ages and backgrounds to experience and enjoy live music, eclectic events and art of all kinds. Healer is unique to Indies artistic topography, a DIY space where artists from all around the city uh, can showcase their work free of charge and monthly exhibitions, both in the general space and in curated front room gallery events. Healer's mission is to serve as a vital resource for, institu for institution of Indianapolis's local art and music communities. Um, so we're very big on upcycling and salvage. Um, the majority of our installations consist of salvaged material from recycling centers, dumpsters, donations, um, the lawn, uh, the main lawn is AstroTurf, which was thrown out by um, Big Car. That was, that was actually coming from the Super Bowl. So the 2012 Super Bowl turf lives on in Healer. Um, and we'll pull so many things from um, the uh, surplus um, overflow from um, universities that have old equipment that they don't need or literally from things on the side of the road um, or anything that people donate. Um, AstroTurf, old cabinets, anything that can be used as infrastructure. Um, I think of the Goodwill outlet where you shop for things rejected from Goodwill that are weighed by the pound as terminal capitalism. 
if I can save it from going to a landfill and upcycling it and turning it into an installation, I will do that. Um, so this is kind of forming Heckler back in 2017, putting the pieces together. Um, it kind of shows the transformation. It's even much, much crazier now. This was taken over two years ago, but you can see as we started to transform uh, this environment, I decided to leave in the cubicles um, so that they could be used as uh, separate self-contained uh, installations. Um, this is my wife uh, putting up a um, uh, part of an installation uh, where my friend from grad school, Hannah Fox, uh, they made this giant plastic funnel. Um, and so they were moving out west and said, do you want the funnel? Uh, and so I repurposed it as this room called the Leviathan room. And this is all just reused plastic. Um, the 90s room, which is just salvaged from people's donations um, old comic books, um, really anything, you know, uh, that I can, tr that I tried to make into the perfect 90s slumber party. And so it's just really grown from there. Uh, you know, I'm very into maximalism, this idea of filling a space, transforming it with multi-sensory um, contributions to create, uh, taking diverse, separate elements and combining that into a unique, overwhelming whole. Uh, is my goal with my installations. Um, this one came from uh, a trip I went on uh, down to Dale Hollow and I took all these old tree branches uh, in driftwood um, and combined with real trees and fake foliage to make a meditative forest room. Um, this zine cave was made out of, you know, old chicken wire and branches and foam. Um, so I, I really believe in transforming material. Um, again, paper mache masks, foliage found at the bins, um, just a variety. These were all security uh, TVs that were donated from Ruckus Makerspace. Um, and then just old, you know, uh, um, that's an old chair at the top of that that's been inverted um, and filled with lights. Um, my, you know, mannequin projects, uh, so much old foliage. Uh, that main altar is actually on old filing cabinets that were found in the space. Uh, this room came from a lot of my grandfather's science equipment from when he passed away. Um, so, you know, a lot of it was old, not working from the 50s and 60s. And I thought combined, it, it could be this crazy, magical, you know, sci-fi tech lab. The business of immersive art, you know, just showing how many new immersive companies are popping up. These are also in, you know, the virtual reality sphere. Uh, if you think about any kind of Instagram factories, I'll go into those, but it's really a, a, a burgeoning trend where people want to directly experience art, not just look at um, something passively. They want to be engaged with it. Uh, the Wonder Museum uh, is an example of this in Chicago. Factory Obscura, which I believe is in Oklahoma City. Um, Otherworld Ohio as one that opened in Columbus. And I actually was fortunate to make uh, two installations for Otherworld Ohio. So I helped create some aspects of this sci-fi kind of mad science lab, and then this alien uh, artifact um, museum, which is very cool. Uh, it's open and totally worth going to. Collaboration, radical inclusivity. Um, back pre-pandemic, um, but we've had a couple of these actually post-pandemic now that we have the outdoor space, which, uh, which we're working on. Um, I would just, you know, call friends and say, hey, who wants to have a day where we just work on art projects? So this is us adding, you know, uh, foliage to chicken wire fencing, uh, making driftwood chandeliers, um, you know, just collaboration uh, in, in, in working on something together. Um, rotating guest installations. The one on the left is all made out of recycled cardboard that Lydia Burris, a local artist, made. Uh, the zine cave was made by um, Jackie and Luke, who are part of a zine called Radical Fluff, a zine collective. Um, so I tr trade out uh, every three to six months installations in these two cubicles uh, that are always rotating with new work by new artists. Um, so much immersive art in many directions, whether it's something that's experiential or VR that's, you know, you safely social distance that you can still experience. Um, 
uh, or a film experience or a, or a game experience, but it really is an, an explosion of, of immersive experiences. Um, so I'll end it with this quote uh, from John Dewey's Art as Experience, which was written back in the 30s. I think is very relevant. Experience is a product of continuous and cumulative interaction of an organic self with the world. There is no other foundation upon which aesthetic theory and criticism can build. Art is the most intimate and energetic means of aiding individuals to share in the arts of living. Civilization is uncivil because human beings are divided into non-communicating sects, races, nations, classes, and, cl and cliques. The task is to restore continuity between the refined and intensified forms of experience that are works of art and the everyday events, doings, and sufferings that are universally recognized to constitute experience. So, you know, immersive art has the power to make someone directly involved uh, with that art, to, sh to, to share in the arts of living rather than being an observer. Um, so, yeah, that's my talk. And for the Q&A, um, hopefully you phone me in and, and uh, I'm excited to field any questions. So thank, thanks for listening.